God really used this trip to lay a foundation in youth ministry that I think he's going to build on for the rest of the year. We were praying for God's spirit to do real heart change in the lives of the students for him to bring about repentance and a deeper love for God's word and for true biblical fellowship to take place. And that's exactly what we saw. We saw students confessing sin, repenting, and turning to walk in the light. We saw students repent of jealousy and worldliness and lust and partying and drugs and immorality and unbelief, turning to Jesus for forgiveness and for help and to walk in obedience. And now we've got students who are daily digging into God's word for themselves, not just as an intellectual exercise or because it's part of their daily checklist, but because they want to meet with Christ. We've got about 45 students who every single day since the retreat, they've been spending 20 minutes meeting with Christ in the word. We've got another group of students that meets together now after school to talk about what they've been learning in God's word. One student who came on the trip, um, he had no previous exposure to the Bible at all coming into the trip. And now he's committed to reading through the New Testament to learn more about this Jesus that he heard so much about on the trip. And we got to witness students practicing true biblical fellowship. It was so thrilling to see students not just praying for each other, but actually with each other. And one really exciting part of the trip for me was seeing how many students began to open up about trials in their life. Students who were going through some great difficulties in their life now, opening up to their small group, to their leaders, getting prayer, getting help, getting encouragement that they can continue to endure and thrive spiritually even in the midst of trials. And so it was so exciting for me to see, not just little flashes in the pan here or there, but real, true, spiritual growth. And to me, that's why I said it's, it's really it seems like God is laying a foundation that he's just going to keep building on in 2018. So like Lauren said, I want to thank you for praying for this trip and supporting this trip. We got to see God do great things and, and we're so, so thankful. Um, well, we've got a few minutes left here for a look into God's word. So if you would, please open your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians 1. It's so important that you see this in God's word for yourself. There's Bibles underneath the chairs. Ephesians 1 is found on page 976. Ephesians, like you've heard, is the book that we studied while we were on the retreat. And this morning, we're going to do our Bible study in verses 15 through 19, which is Paul's prayer for the church in Ephesus. And Paul prays some pretty incredible requests we're going to see for the church, and we want to see what those are and then take those and use those as a guide for us going forward, praying for our middle school students and our high school students. And that's really what I want you to leave here with is, is some prayer requests for our students and for you to actually take those home and pray for our kids. So Ephesians 1, keep turning there. If you're there, we'll just jump right in. Verse 15 says, For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. And Paul tells them, Hey, I've heard a good report about how you're doing spiritually. I've heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus, that your vertical relationship with God is vibrant, that you are abiding in Christ and trusting in him by faith. And I've heard of your love for the saints, that your horizontal relationships are great, that you're loving and caring for your fellow Christians. And when Paul hears this good report about them, he doesn't just say, okay, well, that's a nice report. But he takes that and turns that into thanks to God and, and then he prays for them. And that's what I want you to do. You've heard a good report about our students. And I want it to stop there. I want you to thank God for that. But don't stop there. Pray for more. Be greedy for more spiritual progress in these students' lives. Because that's what Paul does here. And his prayer comes in verse 17. We get to see his first prayer request for the church in 17. Take a look. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation and the knowledge of him. That's his prayer request. Did you, did you catch it in there? Did you see what Paul was asking God for? It's a, it's a little hard to figure out, isn't it? Uh, 
Uh, but what's he asking God for? And here it's actually pretty simple. It's right there at the end. He's praying that they would know God better. That's it. He's just praying that they would know God better. You can write that down if you want because you are going to be praying for these students when you leave here and you're going to want to remember what to pray for. Write that down that they would know God better. When Paul is praying this, when Paul's asking God for this, right, he of course doesn't just mean that they would know more facts about God. He's praying that they would know God relationally better and deeper. That's the request, that their relationship with God would deepen. And Paul tells us how this happens. Did you see that? How how does this deepening relationship with God happen? Paul says that it's by the spirit of wisdom and of revelation. You say, well, wait, what does that mean, spirit of wisdom, revelation? It means that God has chosen to reveal himself through his word, the Bible. And as you read the Bible, not just reading it to read it, not just reading it with eyes kind of glazed over, but as you read God's word to encounter him, to know him, to grow deep with him, the Holy Spirit works supernaturally to help you, to enable you to know God better. And this is how you know God better and deeper, by communing with him in the Bible. And so if you want to know God better, you don't go out in the woods and look for a sign from God. You don't study your dreams to see if you've had a vision from God. You want to know God better, you spend time with him in the Bible. And as you do, the Holy Spirit helps you to know God better and fuller and richer and deeper. And that's Paul's prayer request for the church. And really, we're going to see in this whole text here, it's really the only request that Paul asks for, that they would know God better through the word. Pause for a moment. Does this seem to you when you hear that, like this request is just too simple, like too generic? Like, come on, Paul, you wrote part of the Bible. That's all you got? Just know God better? That, that's it? Nothing deeper? Nothing more? What, just know God better? But Paul is praying this one, this one request because once it happens, once God answers this prayer request, it will unlock three precious gospel truths in the lives of the Ephesian church. Once the church knows God better, Paul knows their Christian experience will deepen in these three ways. Or we could kind of flip that around and say it a different way. Paul is saying that until you know God better, these three truths will always be on the periphery of your life. They will be underutilized and taken for granted and missed out on and not fully experienced. Paul is saying that you aren't able to fully grasp these three gospel truths until you know God better. When I first moved into my house, the house Lauren and I live in now, I was single at the time and in our bathroom, the faucet in the bathroom had two knobs, a a hot water flow and a cold water flow and When I first moved in, I noticed an annoying feature of the house was that the hot water knob worked just fine, got a strong flow, but the cold water was a thin little trickle, even when you had it cranked all the way. You can imagine why this is annoying, right? Because every time you wanted to wash your hands, you had three seconds before the water would become scalding hot because there was so little cold water coming out. Well, I obviously had no idea how to fix this and so fast forward years later meet Lauren date Lauren we get engaged we get married we've been married a few years and I'm watching somebody else put in their sink and I notice that underneath the sink there's a little valve underneath there that controls did everybody else know this (laughs) there's a little valve that controls the water flow and it clicked in my head I'm okay so I went home went to the bathroom sure enough there was one there turn that knob boom Cold water flow has worked great ever since. (laughs) Why am I telling you this boring story about my house? Well, because this is what Paul is saying. Paul is saying that knowing God better and deeper is like that valve under the sink. Until it is turned up, until you know God better and deeper, these three gospel truths will only be a little trickle in your life. They're yours 
And they're true, but they're just not going to be experienced and enjoyed like they ought to be. And so you say, all right, all right, what are these three gospel truths? Look at verse 18. Having the eyes of your hearts enlightened. Pause for a second. He's saying, this is what he's saying. He's saying, once you know God better, once that valve starts to turn, these three gospel truths get unlocked in your life. You start to be able to grasp the significance of these gospel truths. Here's the first one. It's that next phrase. That you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. So that's gospel truth number one, if you're writing that down, because you're going to be praying for these students, right? Nod your head. You're going to be praying for these students, right? Here's gospel truth number one, our eternal hope. That's what that phrase means, our eternal hope. The first gospel truth is our eternal hope. You say, what is this hope Paul's talking about? Our hope is living in the presence of God in the new earth forever. Our hope is that we have an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. Our hope is that one day this this breaking down body of ours will be exchanged for a new resurrection body. Our hope is that the pain and sorrow and tears and injustice and death of this life will all be gone. Our hope is a secured guarantee. And best of all, our hope is that we will see Jesus face to face. That's our hope. And you may say, I already knew that. I already knew that Christians had this eternal hope. Uh, uh, Why is Paul praying for this, right? He's he's praying this for Christians. They already have this hope. This hope is already theirs. Why is Paul praying for this? Well, because until you know God better, the impact of this truth in your life will only be a trickle. Sure, it'll be true, but until you know God better, you won't see it nearly as significantly or as important as it really ought to be in your life. And so Paul prays, God, help them to know you better so that they can grasp the significance of our eternal hope. And think of what this means for a middle school student or a high school student to be able to grasp onto this truth. Right, our students are bombarded by messages about how important physical appearance is. But when you grasp the impact of this gospel truth that I will have a new glorified body soon so I don't need to obsess about this one, what kind of impact can that have? Our students are bombarded by messages about the significance of money and the need to have the newest and best possessions and think about the impact of this gospel truth That one day I will inherit all things and my inheritance can never perish, spoil, or fade. What kind of impact can that have? Our world is obsessed about the here and now and the temporary and the tangible. But when you grasp the impact of this gospel truth that this world is fading away, but my hope is secure. What kind of impact can this have on a middle school student, on a high school student? And this is why Paul is praying this. That until you know God better, this truth will only be a trickle in your life and it won't really seem relevant. It won't really seem significant. And so we must pray. We must pray this for them. Gospel truth number two is that last phrase in the verse. Take a look when he says, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? That phrase is a little hard to understand, right? It sounds like Paul is, is still talking about our eternal inheritance in that phrase, but he's not. He's not talking about our inheritance. He's talking about God's inheritance. Paul is praying that they would know God better so that they would grasp the truth of God's inheritance. You say, well, wait a second here. What what are you talking about? What's God's inheritance? God's inheritance, it says it in the verse. You see it? God's inheritance is his children. It's his people. It's us. The big prize, the big reward, the big inheritance for God at the end is us. And this is why gospel truth number two that we need to grasp is God's love for us. God's love for us. Paul wants the church to know just how deep God's love for us really is. He wants us to see the value God has placed on us by making us his inheritance. The picture here is of God it means so much to me because I have a, a little girl, right? The, the picture is of God just cradling us and, and, and holding us and, and caring for us and, and loving us as our inheritance. And this is why we need to know God better so that we can grasp just how deep, just how profound this love of God for us really is. 
I mean, can you already see how important it is for our students to grasp the significance of this truth of God's love for them? Students are so hung up on being cool and being well-liked by others. And, and does someone who really matters care about me? And can you, can you imagine if this, this gospel truth isn't just a little drip, drip, trickle in their life, but it is flowing into their soul where students aren't trying so hard to impress their friends or be liked by the world, but instead they are so overwhelmed by God's affection and love for them that their whole world flips and instead of trying to impress the world, they're trying to reach the world for Christ. And they go from trying to be loved by the world to pointing the world to the one who loves them so well. And this only happens as they know God better. And so pray. Pray that they would grasp this truth. Last one, number three, it's in verse 19. Take a look. He says, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his great might gospel truth number three is God's resurrection power God's resurrection power Paul is praying that we understand the power of God in our lives and man that this would not be a trickle in their lives but that this would be a fully experienced truth that our students would know the power of God know God's power to kill sin in their lives, that they don't have to be caught up in sin, but that victory is possible, that they would know God's power to endure difficult situations at home, at school, with friends, wherever, that they don't have to give up, that they don't have to give in, that they can endure, that they would know God's power, that one day we will rise and we will be with him forever because Jesus lives, because God raised Jesus from the dead, we will rise too. And that this power of God would be radically experienced by our youth. Pray for this. Pray for this. And so this is Paul's prayer in Ephesians 1. That's incredible, isn't it? I mean, don't your prayers feel so lame in comparison? I mean, I feel like mine do. But I want to pray this. I want to pray like this. And I want you to pray like this for our students. I don't want you to pray for their academic success or for their journey's mercies or whatever. I want you to pray that they would know God better and so that they could grasp these amazing truths. Let me pray. Father, we have one request. Help us and help our students to know you better. Help us to know you better and more deeply, to walk in fellowship with you, to abide in Christ. And God, I pray that as we do, you would help us to better understand, better grapple with, to better experience and know these amazing truths of our eternal hope, of your amazing love for us and your resurrection power. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.